thanks everyone for coming out this morning. Um, after uh, Sandra Singh Lowe's wonderful uh, synopsis, I don't actually need to give this uh, um, talk, so any questions? <laughs> no, um, I'm really honored to be here today and talk to all of you about some research that uh, Reg Penner and I have been working on for about a decade or so, about nine years. Um, we're really passionate about this subject because uh, we've all, we've, we've had family members, close family members who have been affected by this disease. And um, it means a lot to, to us personally that you're here and interested in caring about this topic. So um, specifically, what I want to talk to you about today is the following. Um, so uh, uh, Dean Janda gave us an uh, overview of the uh, university. Let me just tell you very briefly about, let me pick up where uh, Dean Janda left off and uh, focus now on the chemistry department specifically. We've gotten really lucky. Um, our very first uh, chair uh, co-founded the department along with six other very brave uh, souls, some of whom I actually have seen in the audience today. Um, and uh, Sherry Rowland went on to receive the Nobel Prize in Chemistry almost exactly um, 18 years ago to this day. Okay, so, and he received this for something really extraordinary. He, of course, was um, the person who pointed out that chlorofluorocarbons were capable of destroying the ozone layer. And equally importantly, he rallied world support to do something about this, and he legitimately saved the world. He's one of those few people who actually have done something on such magnitude to actually save the entire planet. And um, his, he was also, in addition to being an amazing science and amazing states person, he was also a terrific guy. He was a really humble, down-to-earth, amazingly nice colleague. And so he set a tone for our department of research excellence at the highest level and service to, and commitment to the community at the highest levels as well. And um, since that time, since our founding in 1964, we've gone on to have diverse interdisciplinary research in all areas of chemistry. I would say any length scale of chemistry, from the size of the planet down to nanometer scale, um, we do research in that type of chemistry. And um, today, we're going to be focusing on this area of science, the area of nanotechnology. And we have a large number of, uh, of really great uh, faculty members who are working in these areas, some of whom were, were introduced to you today as uh, our newest faculty members. And I'm really excited about the research taking place in this, in this area. Okay, so um, let me introduce the players who made this work possible. Um, we faculty actually don't get into laboratories all that often to do any experiments, unfortunately. I love doing experiments, but um, I don't have time to do it anymore. So I'm really lucky to work with a very talented team, some of whom you might uh, see in today's audience. I'm really um, pleased to see them here this morning. Uh, this is very early for graduate students, so it's a big <laughs> deal to get them out of bed this early. Um, so uh, the work I'll be talking to you about today was primarily performed by Krithika Mohan, uh, in my laboratory, and I see her, maybe Krithika, you can just uh, stand up very briefly. So, thank you. Thanks, Krithika. Um, and not shown, uh, this was set up by Dr. Jessica Arter, who uh, received a PhD with me a couple of years ago, and is now a, a senior development scientist at uh, Beckman Coulter in Brea, California. Um, this work was also funded by you, the taxpayers, and I'm really grateful for that, by, through um, grants from the National Institute of Health. Um, specifically, the National Cancer Institute has supported the research taking place in my lab in this area, and we're lucky to have other support. Um, very briefly, I would like to point out that I am one of the people being affected by both the sequestration and the um, uh, government shutdown. This is directly affecting my results. At the beginning of the summer, the sequestration, for example, came close to splitting this, uh, this team off in half. I, I was facing a challenge of, raise, raising, of losing half of the funding in the lab based on the sequestration on July 1st. Um, and then more recently, uh, the budget shutdown is also a mess as well. I don't, I'll try not to get into it because it could be a long topic, but you can ask me about it later. Um, now, the Penner Group is also a really fantastic team as well. And um, today we'll be talking about research uh, that was primarily performed by Kristen Eggers. And uh, Lindsay Kindra is also uh, an important player on this team as well. And not shown is a former member of the laboratory, Dr. Keith Donovan, who now teaches chemistry. Um, funding was provided by, again, the taxpayers through grants from the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. These are competitive, very, very highly competitive grants to receive, and we're really uh, thankful for your support. 
Okay, so um, here's the inspiration for this research. So research in the area of nanotechnologies was inspired really by this really amazing uh, genius who is a very quotable individual. This is one of those rare scientists who is capable of generating lots of different quotes. And in uh, 1959, Richard Feynman called for building devices in the tiny, tiny little infinitesimally small range. And his quote was, there's plenty of room at the bottom in that range of tiny little technologies, there's plenty of room to build devices that are really small, and if we do so, these devices should have special properties, unique properties. Those properties um, include things like high surface to volume ratios and uh, high sensitivity that should empower the kinds of sensors for disease detection that I'm going to talk to you about today, that Reg and I are going to talk to you about today. Um, this dream of nanotechnology kind of languished for, for many years until more recently advances in the electronics industry industry has made the dream of nanotechnology possible greater than 50 years later. Now I want to talk to you first about scale. The scale of devices that we're talking about today are incredibly small. Okay, so here's a little uh, scale bar over here going from meters. So here we are at human scale, um, up in the meter scale to cats that are a little bit smaller, at least I think most cats are that you have around the house. Um, and then, uh, you know, my aunt's hairs. Okay, so a hair over here is somewhere in the submillimeter range. Uh, T cells are in the 20 micrometer range. Red blood cells are a little bit smaller. But when we start talking about electronics, we're starting to get down into the submicron range. And when we start talking about proteins, the um, um, machines that play roles in your body and in your cells, then we start getting down into the nanometer range. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So nanotechnology are devices that are in the um, 1 to 100 nanometer scale. So we're going to be talking about really small little tiny devices. And again, um, uh, these will have special properties simply because they're small, because they have the high surface to volume ratios, because they have all the sensitivity. Okay, so um, we're going to be in this range today. Um, at the same time as there's been developments in electronics, there's also been tremendous developments in biotechnology. And um, a lot of this, uh, and for example, we can target and manufacture essentially any bioactive molecule. Okay, so if you come to me and you say, I have some molecule that's associated with cancer and I want to produce enough of it so that you can study it in great detail, biotechnology has given us those tools. And what's really interesting about this is that this has been in continuous development almost as long as there's been human society because this is based upon the ancient brewing technology. So more or less the same technology that's used for brewing beer would be used for producing in large scale um, the molecules associated with cancer. And here's an example of this brewing technology um, that's being taking place at a company called Roche. So um, the development of biotechnology has been parallel to, to electronics technology, yet the two fields really don't talk to each other. And today what I want to talk to you about is, our, is a way of hybridizing these two technological developments because I have this inkling that if we can put these two powerful technologies together, then we'd have a new type of industry and a new type of thinking about the universe, one that would give us tools to explore that universe with unprecedented uh, insights. And um, the, the reason why these two technologies do not overlap is really a communications problem. Right? So the communications in the electronics world uh, are based upon electrons moving through circuits. And the communications in the biology world are based on sort of like Braille, right? You know, Braille, the, the, the raised dots on uh, pages, and you sort of feel the dots and you read. Biology is like that. Biology, biological molecules talk to each other by feeling each other and looking for complementary shapes and complementary functional groups. And so these are two totally different communication styles. So one of the grand challenges that I'm going to be addressing today is how do we put together these two communication styles and get them to talk to each other? How do we, get the, how do we interpret the one communication style of, of uh, touching with the other communication style of electronics? And so schematically, what we're going to be doing are building uh, detectors that merge together bio biotechnology up here together with electronics down here. 
Okay, so here's what it's gonna look like. Down here, this will be the realm of nanotechnology. This includes things like transducers and signal amplification and processing. And up here, we're going to rely upon biotechnology that allow us to grab onto the cancer markers um, and recognize those cancer markers. This is what uh, Sandra Singh Lowe referred to when she said there were sort of like hooks that we're gonna grab onto the cancer markers. So we're gonna basically put these two technologies together and develop sensors, okay? Oh, and by the way, I should have said this earlier, but if anyone has any quick questions that uh, are really important to understanding something, go ahead and ask them now, okay? Just interrupt and ask, because um, sometimes if we answer those questions, then uh, everything else makes a lot more sense, okay? All right, so um, specifically looking at the agenda to develop this technology, there's four areas that Reg and I need to talk to you about. The first of these is the big overview of cancer first, and then we'll talk a little bit about viruses for detecting the cancer-associated molecules. And then Reg will talk to you about a new type of material that is a chimera or a hybrid of viruses and plastic. And then um, we'll put everything together to talk about disease detection. Okay, so schematically, this is what it looks like. All right, so we have the cancer up here, that's the, the pins, and we have some viruses, and I'll explain why viruses in a moment, and then we'll have this new material, and then we'll have sensors over here. Okay, so cancer first. Um, this is a really terrible disease, and we've been working on this, researchers have been working on this disease for a very long time, uh, since Richard Nixon declared war on cancer back in the 70s. And, um, the, the fact is that your chances of dying of cancer are 25% lower than, the, than before the war in can, or, or around when the war of cancer was declared. So we've made some progress, but um, we're not doing nearly well enough. Okay, and in fact, in some diseases, this progress is, um, is really illusionary. Um, in diseases like pancreatic cancer, bladder cancer, and myeloma, your chances of dying of these diseases are virtually unchanged. Okay, and by the way, this is year of death on the x-axis down here and the rate of cancer per 100,000 people in the US. Okay, so there are some diseases we have not made enough progress on. And um, the thing is, cancer is a molecular disease. These are diseases we could make progress on. Okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about why, it, why I think it is that we haven't made progress fast enough in cancer. And before I do, let me uh, introduce you to some very basic cancer biology over here. So let's just talk about bladder cancer as an example. So bladder cancer forms on um, the uh, walls of the bladder. It's often uh, nucleated by environmental risk, things like uh, carcinogens that you ingest are found in the environment, so you inhale unburnt smoke from, or unburnt uh, uh, chemicals from, say, cigarettes or something like that. Um, that could uh, initiate start of a tiny little tumor. That tumor will start growing, and unfortunately, in our era of technology, we will not detect that tumor until it starts to push off from the wall of the, burst, basically burst through the wall of the bladder and, and spills out into the blood vessels and causes um, blood to appear in the urine on this side over here. So pa patients don't go to the physicians until they see that blood in the urine, and that means our diagnosis is way too late. So that only happens over here in stages three and four over here. And the relative five-year survival for stages three and four is much, much worse than it would be if we can catch tumors um, here at stage zero when they're really tiny. Okay, so, um, and then here's some uh, statistics. So 54% of the diagnosis are at stage three or four. So they're in this range over here when um, really it's too late. Okay, we're, well, it's not too late, but it's, it, we've, we're catching it too late. We can do better than that. Okay, and, for, and furthermore, we know we can do better than that, and here's why. We know we can do better because there are molecules associated with cancer that we can find in people's urine. Okay, and the reason for this is that cancer is a molecular disease. Cancer results from molecules run amok. There's some protein in the cell that's decided to hijack the cell and uh, lead to lots and lots of other proteins being inappropriately turned on. And in turn, that leads the cell to start dividing uncontrollably, which then leads to the cancer that I showed you on the previous slide. Now, if there are molecules associated with cancer, then those molecules have to go somewhere. And where they go is into the urine. 
And here's a listing of different urine-associated biomarkers. So these biomarkers are cancer-associated molecules that appear in the urine when someone has cancer. And we think that we can detect, if we can detect a few of these um, specifically and with high sensitivity, then we'd be able to detect cancer at a much earlier stage, which in turn would make it so much more treatable, which in turn would start to move the needle in terms of uh, decreasing the number of deaths that happen from cancer every year. So that's our dream, okay? And this is the, the basis for that dream, which is that there are molecules that are in cancer that we could detect. Okay, so here's what it will all look like if we could do this. Um, what we want to do is basically make a urine dipstick format that would allow us to detect different cancers that are appearing in people's urine. And incidentally, we should also be able to detect other, other diseases that result in the spewing of molecules into the urine. Okay, so um, that's, this is the dream. Um, it would look something like this. Um, this is a home pregnancy test. Uh, this is what Sandra Singh Lowe is referring to. Um, and uh, this technology is based on sort of an ancient uh, lateral flow immunoassay technology. It's not very ancient. It's, you know, on the order of 30 years or something or 40 years. Um, but the problem with this is that it's not very sensitive. Okay, this technology works great, it's robust, it's reliable, but the sensitivity is not there. And in the case of detecting the molecules associated with cancer, we need something that's a lot more sensitive because there aren't a whole lot of those molecules present in urine. Okay, so what we need is that schematic diagram that I showed you earlier where we're going to have um, viruses that then have very much, more, much better electronics over here that can then communicate the um, binding of molecules up here down into electronics so that we can do things like signal amplification and processing. Okay, so um, here's what this would look like. We'd begin with sales to physicians and then, um, and then eventual goal is to have over-the-counter use where you'd basically go into your drugstore and buy something like what I showed on the previous slide. Okay, so I want to talk to you next about the science that we need to do to get there. Okay, that's the, this, is the, this is the background. Um, oh, I should also mention the marketplace is poised for this type of disruptive innovation. Um, there are new companies that are being formed in this area, um, and there are new uh, uh, ventures, uh, venture funds that are investing in this area. Okay, so here's what we're going to need in terms of science, the foundation that we'll, we'll have to establish to make this dream a reality. So what we are going to need is first some hooks that give us a way of recognizing the cancer-associated molecules, the biomarkers that I referred to earlier. And these have to be inexpensive, okay? If we're going to have cancer testing on um, a frequent basis, these things have to be really inexpensive, and they also have to be tough, right? Because people aren't necessarily gonna store lots of things under perfect conditions. Um, and then they also have to be very specific for the cancer biomarkers, and they also have, to, and then the, um, we'll also need some sort of sensitive, power efficient, and inexpensive transducer that converts the biology signal to an electronic signal over here. Okay, so let's talk about the hooks first, the receptors that are gonna grab onto the cancer biomarkers. We turn to our friends, the viruses. These are actually the good viruses, the ones that are on our sides. Um, the kind of viruses I want to talk to you about today are called bacteriophage. And here's um, an atomic force microscope image that was taken by Teresa McIntyre, who I saw in the audience earlier today. Um, down here, you can see there's sort of a little, it looks like a cluster of grapes or something. That's the head of the virus. Okay, and let me show, let's uh, zoom in and take a closer, oh, before we, I'll, we'll zoom in in a moment and I'll tell you more about this virus. Um, before we do, I should make, I should, um, I should acknowledge that this is an unconventional strategy. Okay, the conventional strategy is the following. The conventional strategy is to use monoclonal antibodies as the hooks or the receptors for um, conventional sensing. And um, this was uh, established by, amongst others, Cesar Milstein in, back in the 70s. Um, these are really effective binders to essentially any molecule. The, the problem is um, their production is laborious and expensive. These are really expensive to use um, uh, hooks. And furthermore, they require refrigeration, they're kind of delicate, and they also, um, there's a lot of extensive intellectual property that's been filed on them. So it's hard to establish something new in an area that has, um, way, uh, that has a huge amount of overlapping claims. 
So um, viruses, it turns out, will do everything that antibodies will do. These are the conventional ones, um, and they'll do it even better. So for example, um, where the antibodies require refrigeration, viruses are stable to 85 degrees. Um, these guys hate having organic solvents or detergent around. These guys, the viruses, will readily tolerate those conditions. This is important because it means downstream for manufacturing and processing, the viruses will be uh, able to handle the, those types of conditions. Um, furthermore, the affinity, that's their stickiness, and the specificity um, are both uh, equivalent, really, to antibodies. And the most important factor is where the cost of these antibodies is high, the cost of our virus friends is very low because they really exist to make more copies of themselves. That's the virus's life. That's, that's their raison d'etre. That's why they exist, to live. So they want to make lots and lots of copies of themselves. So we can take advantage of that and uh, basically um, raise viruses to, um, to other things. Okay, so um, here's some, uh, some cheerful facts about viruses. Uh, viruses are about a micron in length, for example. Uh, this, this particular virus, these are called M13 uh, filamentous bacteriophage. These viruses also only infect bacteria, and that's why they're called bacteriophage. And in fact, they play a very important role in both your body and also in the environment in controlling bacteria levels. They're really important because they slow bacteria's ability to grow. Um, by uh, infecting them. Um, they, uh, they, and again, I've already told you a little bit about their, their structure, so I'll, I'll move on. Okay, now here's why we're using viruses for recognition. It turns out that we can, in the laboratory, do a process of Darwinian evolution to raise viruses that will bind with high affinity, high stickiness, and high specificity to cancer biomarkers. Here's the way this would work. Okay, so um, here's the virus again. Again, that's the cluster of grapes at the head of the virus. We can manipulate the DNA that's encoded by this virus and make a big collection called the library of different viruses. And I'm showing three over here. Each one has a different protein or a different hook being displayed on its surface. In practice, though, our laboratory makes billions to trillions of different viruses, each one with a different hook on its surface. And then we're ready for the Darwinian evolution. Right? So what we can do to evolve these guys is throw them against the target biomarker. This is the cancer biomarker, which looks like Pac-Man um, in this, uh, in this uh, schematic. Um, and then we wash away the non-binders over here, collect up these binders, the hooks that win, and then amplify them up in the E. coli host uh, for the virus. And if you do this several times, five times, up to five times, you will start to enrich for a few members of that billions of compound library that actually work really well at targeting your cancer marker. Okay, so this gives us the hooks that we need to grab onto the cancer markers out in the urine, okay? All right, so I've told you a little bit about cancer. I've told you a little bit about viruses. And here to tell you um, about, um, about the next steps over here, the, the material and the disease detection, I'm going to turn things over to Reg. Thanks. Good morning. Good to see so many uh, familiar faces and old friends. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to finish the uh, presentation here. Uh, it shouldn't be too much longer. Greg, uh, describe the problem. All right, the problem is we can't detect cancer early enough, but uh, it's pathetic how, how badly we are doing with early detection. We, we, when you go to the doctor now and you do uh, routine urinalysis, you're not tested for cancer at all, right? None of us are. And so we could fix that problem and uh, hopefully be able to do early detection of cancer. The key to this technology are Greg's viruses. And the reason they're the key is because they're going to allow us to replace antibodies, right? Antibodies are enormously expensive, right? If you want a biosensor that you can go to the drugstore and pay $5 for, It'll never work based on antibodies. They're way too expensive. But Greg can manufacture a virus that binds a, a target molecule with all the affinity of an antibody, all right? But it's dirt cheap, right? He can make gram quantities of these viruses that have the same binding properties 
as antibodies. All right, that's the key to this technology. That's why we're so excited about it. The problem is no one's made biosensors based on viruses before, so we have to figure out the whole thing. It's not enough just to have a virus that mimics an antibody. Now we have to figure out how do you plug this virus into a biosensor? How do you read out when it's been successful in capturing its target molecule? How do we know that electrically? All right, these are answers that we, that, uh, these are questions that haven't been answered before. Greg showed this slide. Greg's been talking about these guys. These guys are the, the central players in the talk today. They're the viruses, right? They're what make our biosensors special. Now I'm going to talk about how we attach these guys and make a biosensor out of them and how we make a measurement that allows us to tell that the viruses have recognized and bound their target molecules. So how do you attach the virus particles? You have to attach them without destroying them. Right, we want them to retain all the properties that, all the good properties that we know they have when they're free, right, but we have to stick them down on the surface without destroying them. And then we have to read out, right, when these virus particles detect the molecule that they're supposed to bind, all right, we have to have a way to electrically tell that that has occurred. Right, how do we do that? So basically we have to talk electrically to the viruses somehow. This uh, is a plastic film that contains vi these virus particles that Greg has been telling you about embedded in it. This is the next uh, uh, exciting thing that I want to tell you about. So I'm going to call this virus plastic. It's an unwieldy term. But I'm going I'm to tell you why that's important. So Greg mentioned that we started to work on this problem in 2005 and we had some amazingly talented students uh, who were the first to make virus uh, biosensors. And Greg remembers these students. They were just uh, stellar. One of them worked in my group. Her name was Li Mei, Mei Yang. And um, she, together with students in Greg's group, developed this chemistry for attaching the viruses, which are these green things over here, sticking them down onto a glass surface or a metal surface. And it took us about three years to refine this chemistry to the point where this process worked. Now, if you're not a chemist, you can still appreciate that this is a mess, right? I think you can look at this and you can tell this is a complex set of reactions that has to occur. Reaction one, reaction two, reaction three, reaction four. This is the biosensor over here. What we found is in spite of the fact that we had these killer students working in our groups, our success rate in making these biosensors was about 60 percent. Forty percent of the devices that we tried to make wouldn't work on, uh, on day one. The problem was if any one of these reactions was imperfect in any way when we built up our virus layer, all right, what this surface looks like is a shag carpet of these stringy viruses coming off the surface. All right, if we made a mistake in any one of these reactions, there were holes in the shag carpet and the biosensor wouldn't work at all. Now we tried to refine the chemistry to make it more reliable. The best we were ever, ever able to do was 60%. There's no way you can build a, a commercial device based on those kinds of statistics. You can't throw away 40 percent of the devices that you're trying to manufacture, right? So this was a disaster for us. We tr tried to find a better way. We started looking for a better way five years ago and it took us about three years of working on this before we hit on something that worked uh, unbelievably well. The basic idea is the following. Again, I apologize for the chemistry. <laughs> The basic idea is this is an organic molecule that can be strung together to make a, a polymer, all right, a plastic. This plastic's interesting because it's not the plastics that we're familiar with, like the plastics of this juice glass over here, all right. It's a, a electronically conductive plastic. In other words, it's a plastic that can conduct electrons. That's important. What we do is, is we uh, polymerize this plastic. Um, by flowing some electrons uh, into a solution that contains this monomer, all right? So if you're a chemist, you can see that there's some electrons over here. If we oxidize this monomer, we can form a plastic 
on a gold surface, for example, all right, the gold is going to be the source of electrons or the sink for electrons. We're going to form a, a plastic film just like plating chrome onto the bumper of your car. All right, we can plate this plastic onto a gold biosensor. Now, notice something here. This plastic has a positive charge. So as we're growing this plastic film, it builds up a positive charge. What Greg didn't tell you about the viruses is that they're negatively charged. Right? They're covered with 6,000 negative charges, every virus. And so we reasoned that if we grew this plastic film in a solution that contained the monomer and the virus, as we grow the film, we're going to suck the virus in and make a composite between the virus and the film. If this worked, we could make, we could anchor the virus in a single step. We wouldn't have to do four steps of organic chemistry to make this happen. Let's see how this works. All right, here's a, a gold film where we've grown the plastic Okay, in the absence of the virus and what you see is sort of a smooth surface for the film. And then what we do is we grow films from solutions that contain a small concentration of virus, medium and high. Now this is a little confusing. This is a low magnification picture of the film and this is a high magnification picture, right, in each case. So you can see the difference. Here's the plastic film when there's no virus present and when we add a little bit of virus to the solution, you start to see this rough textured surface. This texture are bundles of the virus getting sucked into the polymer film as we grow it. Now we can be absolutely quantitative. We know exactly how much virus is going to this film because we can make an ultra sensitive weight measurement of the film as we're growing it and I don't want to go into the details but one, one of the cool things that surprised us is that when we grow this film the concentration of virus in the film is 500 times higher than it is in the solution. In other words, as we're growing this film, it is very efficiently sucking the virus out of the solution as it grows and concentrating it within the film. All right, and that's what this data shows. This is the concentration of the virus inside the plastic film. This is the concentration of the virus in the solution that we're using to grow the film. And the slope of this line is almost 500. All right, that blew us away. That meant this works far better than we imagined it, it possibly could. So the basic idea then is to use these surfaces as the surface of the biosensor, as the capture surface for the biosensor. And the, the reason that's cool is because this happens in one step, right? There isn't four steps, there isn't the possibility for a mistake, all right? If you can get this one step right, you can build the biosensor that you want. We just got the patent issued on this idea three weeks ago. And so uh, hopefully this means no one else is going to be able to do this before <laughs> we can build this device. Now, I've told you how we're going to stick the virus down on a surface, but I haven't explained how that allows us to build a biosensor. All I've shown you is we can trap the virus in a plastic film. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Now you might think that we've worked out all the details of how this biosensor is going to work, but you'd be wrong. We're competing different device architectures against one another to figure out which one is going to be the best for building the biosensor. The green stuff in this picture is the virus P dot material, the virus plastic material that I've been telling you about. All right, so this plastic material that has the virus embedded in it, that's what I'm showing here in green. All right, so the simplest idea is we can take an electrode, just cover it with a film of this virus plastic stuff and that can be the biosensor. Or we can make nanowires of this plastic uh, virus material or we can make a gold nanowire, make it form a gap in it and cover that with a virus plastic material. These are all possible architectures that the biosensor could have. And right now, this week in fact, we're competing these different architectures against one another to figure out which one is going to be the most efficient. But I'm just going to show you data for this, which is in some ways the simplest idea. And then I'm going to just show you some snapshots of what these guys look like because they look cool. So 
Let's look at a film first. This has the potential to get technical, but we're not going to allow that to happen. All right, this is just a two-dimensional representation of the resistance of one of these plastic films that has virus in it. Right, it's a two-dimensional representation. This is the capacitive reactance of that film. This is the resistance of the film. You don't need to understand all that, but what you do need to understand is that here are two measurements uh, for one of these pl uh, virus plastic films in a solution where there's nothing in the solution that can bind to the surface. Right, these are control measurements. And what you can see is that frequency by frequency, these two dots, the red dot and the black dot, are right on top of one another. This is increasing frequency. Here's one kilohertz, okay? And so the point is, is that there's one line that characterizes the resistance of this film when there's nothing in the solution that can bind to the film. As soon as the target molecule is introduced, we get the green representation, we get the green data, and what you can see is here's the one kilohertz data points for the black and the red, here's the one kilohertz data point for the green curve, and there's a shift. All right, this is the signal, this is the virus telling us, hey, I found the molecule that I'm trying to bind, I've bound it, okay, here's the signal, All right? I'm telling you that this binding event has occurred. Right, and so all we have to do is measure this, and this is dead easy to measure. This is like 30, 40 ohms, all right? This is incredibly easy to measure. The only question is what frequency do you want to use to make the measurement, and that's something that we study. Turns out you want to be above 10 hertz. Here's a range of frequencies where the biosensor works. Any place above 10 hertz or so, you have plenty of signal to noise to make the measurement that we want to make. How does this film work? Why does its resistance change? We don't fully understand that and we're trying to get to the bottom of it and we're conducting experiments to try and figure out exactly how it works because it doesn't work the same way as any previous biosensor as far as we can tell. All right, it looks like it has a mechanical mechanism. It looks like here's the virus, here's the uh, conducting polymer, this blue stuff, and here are the molecules that we're trying to detect. And what I'm trying to depict here in this cartoon is that when the molecules are bound, Right, the mechanical structure of the, of the plastic film is disrupted. Right? And in fact, the, the resistance of this film always goes up when the binding event occurs. It doesn't matter whether this molecule is positively charged, negatively charged, makes no difference. The resistance of this plastic film always goes up when the binding event occurs. This is unlike any other biosensor. So this is the most important slide of, I would say, both presentations because it, it shows that it works, all right? So this is a measurement of this new cancer marker, PSMA, in urine. And this is uh, actually, this cartoon depicts a super virus that the Weiss lab has created specifically to bind PSMA with extremely high affinities. This is a, there are tricks involved in creating this virus, but it, they're tricks that could only be applied to viruses. And uh, if you go all the way down, so this is a plot of the signal of the biosensor on this axis, and this is a plot of the concentration of the PSMA that we're trying to detect on this axis. And so the, the interesting area is way down here at this intercept down here, and if you blow that up, this is what the data looks like. And at this little data point right here, is 100 picomolar. And so, to our knowledge, this is the first time anyone's been able to detect a cancer marker in urine at such a low concentration. And it shows that this uh, idea uh, can be used to do cancer detection in urine. So it makes us very excited. This is actually the data of Kritika Moan, who uh, is sitting right over there. Now, <clears throat> There's some aficionados in the audience who know the landscape very, very well, and there are other types of electrical biosensors that you may know about. There are transistors that do biosensing, and we're pulling for these guys too because they're very, very sensitive and they can do cancer detection uh, in a variety of ways, but the advantage of our technology is that we're able to do biosensing in solutions that have a high salt concentration because the mechanism of our biosensor relies on mechanical disruption of a plastic film 
right? Not on electrostatics. And the transistors can only work at super low salt concentrations because they have to use electrostatics to detect the binding of molecules to the gate of the transistor. So they're exquisitely sensitive when there's no salt around, but if, as soon as you add salt to the solution and urine is a salty solution, right, the biosensor won't work anymore. All right, so what's critically important is that this technology, for reasons that we still don't fully understand, works great in salty solutions and most of the bile, most of the solutions that we want to be able to test, blood and urine in particular, are salty solutions where conventional biotechnologies have trouble, this one works. And that's uh, very exciting and very important because it means you can directly, you don't have to process urine in any way, you can just literally use a dipstick to make the measurement. So uh, I just want to show you a few pretty pictures for what these other devices look like. Right? They don't work any better right, than what I've just shown you, but I want to give you a flavor for what we're trying to do. We can make nanowires of this plastic virus stuff. Right? We can make biosensors from those. So this is, this is a plastic, these are plastic nanowires on glass, these lines right here. And then if we put virus in them, you can see the stringy stuff coming out of the plastic. Those are, those are Greg's viruses coming out of the, uh, the plastic nanowires. All right, and these guys work great as biosensors. In other words, we can do the same cancer detection trick by making a resistance measurement through these nanowires. The third idea is actually to make a single uh, wire out of gold all right, and the problem with the single wire uh, that people never tell you about is a single nanowire has a super high resistance. It's a nanowire, all right? And so if you've got one nanowire of, of plastic, by golly, its resistance could be in the 100 mega ohm range. All right, so the, the way you solve that problem is you make the nanowire out of gold, by golly, that's got a good conductivity, and then you make a little gap in the gold all right, and then you fill that gap with the virus plastic material, this magical material that does the biosensing. And so we can do that as well. So here's the gold nanowire now. That's a 200 micron bar, so this is about uh, 0.2 millimeters. And then we can flow a lot of current through this gold nanowire and we can force it to break. And we do this in such a way that it forms a very small break. And then we can cover the break with this virus plastic material. That's this gray stuff here, believe it or not. These, ba these balls are actually balls of the virus that are poking out of the plastic. All right, and this just shows sort of what the signal looks like. But suffice it to say is that this guy can do the biosensing function much the same way that the nanowires can, much the way, same way that the films can. Right now, the films are slightly better than these other architectures, but we're not done trying. So uh, 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 that's basically uh, the talk that we wanted to give you today, and uh, I hope you'll feel free to ask us some questions, and Greg will answer the ones that I can't answer, and uh, thank you so much for coming this morning.